Standard Oil Co., Inc. was an American oil producing, transporting, refining, and marketing company. Established in 1870 by John D. Rockefeller and Henry Flagler as a corporation in Ohio, it was the largest oil refinery in the world of its time. Its history as one of the world's first and largest multinational corporations ended in 1911, when the United States Supreme Court, in a landmark case, ruled that Standard Oil was an illegal monopoly. Standard Oil dominated the oil products market initially through horizontal integration in the refining sector, then, in later years vertical integration, the company was an innovator in the development of the business trust. The Standard Oil Trust streamlined production and logistics, lowered costs, and undercut competitors. Trust busting. Critics accused Standard Oil of using aggressive pricing to destroy competitors and form a monopoly that threatened other businesses. Rockefeller ran the company as its chairman, until his retirement in 1897. He remained the major shareholder, and in 1911, with the dissolution of the Standard Oil Trust into 34 smaller companies, Rockefeller became the richest man in the world, as the initial income of these individual enterprises proved to be much bigger than that of a single larger company. Its successors such as ExxonMobil or Chevron are still among the companies with the largest income worldwide. By 1882, his top aide was John Dustin Archbold. After 1896, Rockefeller disengaged from business to concentrate on his philanthropy, leaving Archbold in control. Other notable Standard Oil principals include Henry Flagler, developer of the Florida East Coast Railway and Resort Cities, and Henry H. Rogers, who built the Virginian Railway. Topic founding and early years Standard Oil's prehistory began in 1863 as an Ohio partnership formed by industrialist John D. Rockefeller, his brother William Rockefeller, Henry Flagler, chemist Samuel Andrews, silent partner Stephen V. Harkness, and Oliver Burr Jennings, who had married the sister of William Rockefeller's wife. In 1870, Rockefeller abolished the partnership and incorporated Standard Oil in Ohio. Of the initial 10,000 shares, John D. Rockefeller received 2,667, Harkness received 1,334, William Rockefeller, Flagler, and Andrews received 1,333 each, Jennings received 1,000, and the firm of Rockefeller, Andrews and Flagler received 1,000. Rockefeller chose the «Standard Oil» name as a symbol of the reliable «standards» of quality and service that he envisioned for the nascent oil industry. In the early years, John D. Rockefeller dominated the combine, he was the single most important figure in shaping the new oil industry. He quickly distributed power and the tasks of policy formation to a system of committees, but always remained the largest shareholder. Authority was centralized in the company's main office in Cleveland, but decisions in the office were made in a cooperative way. The company grew by increasing sales and through acquisitions. After purchasing competing firms, Rockefeller shut down those he believed to be inefficient and kept the others. In a seminal deal, in 1868, the Lake Shore Railroad, a part of the New York Central, gave Rockefeller's firm a going rate of one cent a gallon or 42 cents a barrel, an effective 71% discount from its listed rates in return for a promise to ship at least 60 carloads of oil daily and to handle load and unload on its own. Smaller companies decried such deals as unfair because they were not producing enough oil to qualify for discounts. 
standards actions and secret transport deals helped its kerosene price to drop from 58 to 26 cents from 1865 to 1870. Rockefeller used the Erie Canal as a cheap alternative form of transportation, in the summer months when it was not frozen, to ship his refined oil from Cleveland to New York City. In the winter months his only options were the three trunk lines, the Erie Railroad and the New York Central Railroad to New York City, and the Pennsylvania Railroad to Philadelphia. Competitors disliked the company's business practices, but consumers liked the lower prices. Standard Oil, being formed well before the discovery of the Spindletop Oil Field in Texas, far from Standard Oil's base in the Midwest and a demand for oil other than for heat and light, was well placed to control the growth of the oil business. The company was perceived to own and control all aspects of the trade. Topic: South Improvement Company. In 1872, Rockefeller joined the South Improvement Co., which would have allowed him to receive rebates for shipping and drawbacks on oil his competitors shipped. But when this deal became known, competitors convinced the Pennsylvania legislature to revoke South Improvement's charter. No oil was ever shipped under this arrangement. Using highly effective tactics, later widely criticized, it absorbed or destroyed most of its competition in Cleveland in less than two months and later throughout the northeastern United States. Topic. Hepburn Committee A. Barton Hepburn was directed by the New York State Legislature in 1879 to investigate the railroad's practice of giving rebates within the state. Merchants without ties to the oil industry had pressed for the hearings. Prior to the committee's investigation, few knew of the size of Standard Oil's control and influence on seemingly unaffiliated oil refineries and pipelines. Hawk 1980 cites that only a dozen or so within Standard Oil knew the extent of company operations. The committee counsel, Simon Stern, questioned representatives from the Erie Railroad and the New York Central Railroad and discovered that at least half of their long-haul traffic granted rebates, and that much of this traffic came from Standard Oil. The committee then shifted focus to Standard Oil's operations. John Dustin Archbold, as president of Acme Oil Company, denied that Acme was associated with Standard Oil. He then admitted to being a director of Standard Oil. The committee's final report scolded the railroads for their rebate policies and cited Standard Oil as an example. This scolding was largely moot to Standard Oil's interests since long-distance oil pipelines were now their preferred method of transportation. <laughs> <laughs> Standard Oil Trust In response to state laws trying to limit the scale of companies, Rockefeller and his associates developed innovative ways of organizing, to effectively manage their fast-growing enterprise. On January 2, 1882, they combined their disparate companies, spread across dozens of states, under a single group of trustees. By a secret agreement, the existing 37 stockholders conveyed their shares in trust to nine trustees, John and William Rockefeller, Oliver H. Payne, Charles Pratt, Henry Flagler, John D. Archbold, William G. Warden, Jabez Bostwick, and Benjamin Brewster. This organization proved so successful that other giant enterprises adopted this trust form 
In 1885, Standard Oil of Ohio moved its headquarters from Cleveland to its permanent headquarters at 26 Broadway in New York City. Concurrently, the trustees of Standard Oil of Ohio chartered the Standard Oil Co. of New Jersey to take advantages of New Jersey's more lenient corporate stock ownership laws. Sherman Antitrust Act In 1890, Congress passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, a source of American anti-monopoly laws. The law forbade every contract, scheme, deal, or conspiracy to restrain trade, though the phrase, "'restraint of trade' remained subjective. The Standard Oil Group quickly attracted attention from antitrust authorities leading to a lawsuit filed by Ohio Attorney General David K. Watson. From 1882 to 1906, Standard paid out $548,436,000 in dividends at 65.4% payout ratio. The total net earnings from 1882 to 1906 amounted to $838,783,800, exceeding the dividends by $290,347,800, which was used for plant expansions. Topic. 1895–1913 In 1896, John Rockefeller retired from the Standard Oil Co. of New Jersey, the holding company of the group, but remained president and a major shareholder. Vice President John Dustin Archbold took a large part in the running of the firm. In the year 1904, Standard Oil controlled 91% of oil production and 85% of final sales in the United States. At this point in time, state and federal laws sought to counter this development with antitrust laws. In 1911, the U.S. Justice Department sued the group under the federal antitrust law and ordered its breakup into 34 companies. Standard Oil's market position was initially established through an emphasis on efficiency and responsibility. While most companies dumped gasoline in rivers this was before the automobile was popular, Standard used it to fuel its machines. While other companies' refineries piled mountains of heavy waste, Rockefeller found ways to sell it. For example, Standard created the first synthetic competitor for beeswax and bought the company that invented and produced Vaseline, the Cheeseboro Manufacturing Co., which was a Standard company only from 1908 until 1911. One of the original muckrakers was Ida M. Tarbell, an American author and journalist. Her father was an oil producer whose business had failed due to Rockefeller's business dealings. After extensive interviews with a sympathetic senior executive of Standard Oil, Henry H. Rogers, Tarbell's investigations of Standard Oil fueled growing public attacks on Standard Oil and on monopolies in general. Her work was published in 19 parts in McClure's magazine from November 1902 to October 1904, then in 1904 as the book The History of the Standard Oil Co. The Standard Oil Trust was controlled by a small group of families. Rockefeller stated in 1910, 
I think it is true that the Pratt family, the Payne Whitney family, which were one, as all the stock came from Colonel Payne, the Harkness Flagler family, which came into the company together, and the Rockefeller family controlled a majority of the stock during all the history of the company up to the present time. These families reinvested most of the dividends in other industries, especially railroads. They also invested heavily in the gas and the electric lighting business including the giant Consolidated Gas Co. of New York City. They made large purchases of stock in U.S. steel, amalgamated copper, and even corn products refining co. Wheatman Pearson, a British petroleum entrepreneur in Mexico, began negotiating with Standard Oil in 1912-13 to sell his El Aguila oil company, since Pearson was no longer bound to promises to the Porfirio Diaz regime 1876-1911 to not to sell to U.S. interests. However, the deal fell through and the firm was sold to Royal Dutch Shell. In China Standard Oil's production increased so rapidly it soon exceeded U.S. demand and the company began viewing export markets. In the 1890s, Standard Oil began marketing kerosene to China's large population of close to 400 million as lamp fuel. For its Chinese trademark and brand Standard Oil adopted the name Mei Fu Chinese, Mei Fu which translates to American Trust. Mei Fu also became the name of the tin lamp that Standard Oil produced and gave away or sold cheaply to Chinese farmers, encouraging them to switch from vegetable oil to kerosene. Response was positive, sales boomed and China became Standard Oil's largest market in Asia. Prior to Pearl Harbor, Stanvac was the largest single U.S. investment in Southeast Asia. The North China Department of Sokani Standard Oil Company of New York operated a subsidiary called Sokani River and Coastal Fleet, North Coast Division, which became the North China Division of Stanvac Standard Vacuum Oil Company after that company was formed in 1933. To distribute its products, Standard Oil constructed storage tanks, canneries bulk oil from large ocean tankers was repackaged into 5 U.S. gallon 19 L, 4.2 imp gal tins, warehouses and offices in key Chinese cities. For inland distribution the company had motor tank trucks and railway tank cars, and for river navigation it had a fleet of low draft steamers and other vessels. Stanvac's North China Division, based in Shanghai, owned hundreds of river-going vessels, including motor barges, steamers, launches, tugboats and tankers. Up to 13 tankers operated on the Yangtze River, the largest of which were Mei Ping 1,118 gross tonnage GT, Mei Sha 1,048 GT, and Mei An 934 GT. All three were destroyed in the 1937 USS Panay incident. Mayan was launched in 1901 and was the first vessel in the fleet. Other vessels included Mei Chuan, Mei Fu, Mei Hung, Mei Qiang, Mei Lu, Mei Tan, Mei Su, Mei Sha, Mei Ying, and Mei Yun. Mei Sha, a tanker, was specially designed for river duty and was built by New Engineering and Shipbuilding Works of Shanghai, who also built the 500-ton launch Mei Fu in 1912. Mei Sha, beautiful gorgas, was launched in 1926 and carried 350 tons of bulk oil in three holds, plus a forward cargo hold, and space between decks for carrying general cargo or packed oil. 
She had a length of 206 feet 63 meters, a beam of 32 feet 9.8 meters, depth of 10 feet 6 inches 3.2 meters, and had a bullet-proof wheelhouse. Mei Ping, Beautiful Tranquility, launched in 1927, was designed offshore, but assembled and finished in Shanghai. Its oil fuel burners came from the U.S. and water tube boilers came from England. In the Middle East Standard Oil Company and Sokini Vacuum Oil Company became partners in providing markets for the oil reserves in the Middle East. In 1906, Socony opened its first fuel terminals in Alexandria. It explored in Palestine before the World War broke out, but ran into conflict with the British government. <laughs> Monopoly charges and antitrust legislation By 1890, Standard Oil controlled 88% of the refined oil flows in the United States. The state of Ohio successfully sued Standard, compelling the dissolution of the trust in 1892. But Standard simply separated Standard Oil of Ohio and kept control of it. Eventually, the state of New Jersey changed its incorporation laws to allow a company to hold shares in other companies in any state. So, in 1899, the Standard Oil Trust, based at 26 Broadway in New York, was legally reborn as a holding company, the Standard Oil Co. of New Jersey SOCNJ, which held stock in 41 other companies, which controlled other companies, which in turn controlled yet other companies. According to Daniel Jurgen in his Pulitzer Prize winning The Prize, The Epic Quest for Oil, Money, and Power 1990, this conglomerate was seen by the public as all-pervasive, controlled by a select group of directors, and completely unaccountable. In 1904, Standard controlled 91% of production and 85% of final sales. Most of its output was kerosene, of which 55% was exported around the world. After 1900 it did not try to force competitors out of business by underpricing them. The Federal Commissioner of Corporations studied standards operations from the period of 1904 to 1906 and concluded that, beyond question, the dominant position of the Standard Oil Co. in the refining industry was due to unfair practices to abuse of the control of pipelines, to railroad discriminations, and to unfair methods of competition in the sale of the refined petroleum products. Due to competition from other firms, their market share had gradually eroded to 70% by 1906 which was the year when the antitrust case was filed against Standard, and down to 64% by 1911 when Standard was ordered broken up and at least 147 refining companies were competing with Standard including Gulf, Texaco, and Shell. It did not try to monopolize the exploration and pumping of oil its share in 1911 was 11 in 1909, the U.S. Department of Justice sued Standard under federal antitrust law, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, for sustaining a monopoly and restraining interstate commerce by rebates, 
preferences, and other discriminatory practices in favor of the combination by railroad companies, restraint and monopolization by control of pipelines, and unfair practices against competing pipelines, contracts with competitors in restraint of trade, unfair methods of competition, such as local price cutting at the points where necessary to suppress competition, and espionage of the business of competitors, the operation of bogus independent companies, and payment of rebates on oil, with the like intent. The lawsuit argued that Standard's monopolistic practices had taken place over the preceding four years. The general result of the investigation has been to disclose the existence of numerous and flagrant discriminations by the railroads in behalf of the Standard Oil Co. and its affiliated corporations. With comparatively few exceptions, mainly of other large concerns in California, the Standard has been the sole beneficiary of such discriminations. In almost every section of the country that company has been found to enjoy some unfair advantages over its competitors, and some of these discriminations affect enormous areas. The government identified four illegal patterns, one, secret and semi-secret railroad rates, two, discriminations in the open arrangement of rates, three, discriminations in classification and rules of shipment, four, discriminations in the treatment of private tank cars. The government alleged, Almost everywhere the rates from the shipping points used exclusively, or almost exclusively, by the standard are relatively lower than the rates from the shipping points of its competitors. Rates have been made low to let the standard into markets, or they have been made high to keep its competitors out of markets. Trifling differences in distances are made an excuse for large differences in rates favorable to the Standard Oil Co., while large differences in distances are ignored where they are against the standard. Sometimes connecting roads prorate on oil. That is, make through rates which are lower than the combination of local rates. Sometimes they refuse to prorate, but in either case, the result of their policy is to favor the Standard Oil Co. Different methods are used in different places and under different conditions, but the net result is that from Maine to California the general arrangement of open rates on petroleum oil is such as to give the standard an unreasonable advantage over its competitors. The government said that Standard raised prices to its monopolistic customers but lowered them to hurt competitors, often disguising its illegal actions by using bogus supposedly independent companies it controlled. The evidence is, in fact, absolutely conclusive that the Standard Oil Co. charges altogether excessive prices where it meets no competition, and particularly where there is little likelihood of competitors entering the field, and that, on the other hand, where competition is active, it frequently cuts prices to a point which leaves even the Standard little or no profit, and which more often leaves no profit to the competitor, whose costs are ordinarily somewhat higher. On May 15, 1911, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the lower court judgment and declared the Standard Oil Group to be an unreasonable monopoly under the Sherman Antitrust Act, Section 2. It ordered Standard to break up into 34 independent companies with different boards of directors. The biggest two of the companies were Standard Oil of New Jersey, which became Exxon, and Standard Oil of New York, which became Mobil. Standard's president, John D. Rockefeller, had long since retired from any management role. But, as he owned a quarter of the shares of the resultant companies, and those share values mostly doubled, he emerged from the dissolution as the richest man in the world. The dissolution had actually propelled Rockefeller's personal wealth. 
Topic breakup by 1911, with public outcry at a climax, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled, in Standard Oil Co. of New Jersey v. United States, that Standard Oil of New Jersey must be dissolved under the Sherman Antitrust Act and split into 34 companies. Two of these companies were Standard Oil of New Jersey, Jersey Standard or Esso, which eventually became Exxon, and Standard Oil of New York, Socony, which eventually became Mobil. Those two companies later merged into ExxonMobil. Over the next few decades, both companies grew significantly. Jersey Standard, led by Walter C. Teagle, became the largest oil producer in the world. It acquired a 50% share in Humble Oil and Refining Co., a Texas oil producer. Socony purchased a 45% interest in Magnolia Petroleum Co., a major refiner, marketer and pipeline transporter. In 1931, Socony merged with Vacuum Oil Co., an industry pioneer dating back to 1866, and a growing Standard Oil spin off in its own right. In the Asia Pacific region, Jersey Standard had oil production and refineries in Indonesia but no marketing network. Socony Vacuum had Asian marketing outlets supplied remotely from California. In 1933, Jersey Standard and Socony Vacuum merged their interests in the region into a 50-50 joint venture. Standard Vacuum Oil Co., or Stanvac, operated in 50 countries, from East Africa to New Zealand, before it was dissolved in 1962. The original Standard Oil Company corporate entity continues in existence and was the operating entity for Sohio, it is now a subsidiary of BP. However, BP continued to sell gasoline under the Sohio brand until 1991. Other Standard Oil entities include Standard Oil of Indiana which became Amico after other mergers and a name change in the 1980s, and Standard Oil of California which became the Chevron Corp. Topic legacy and criticism of breakup The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1911 that antitrust law required Standard Oil to be broken into smaller, independent companies. Among the «baby standards» that still exist are ExxonMobil and Chevron. Some have speculated that if not for that court ruling, Standard Oil could have possibly been worth more than $1 trillion in the 2000s. Whether the breakup of Standard Oil was beneficial is a matter of some controversy. Some economists believe that Standard Oil was not a monopoly, and also argue that the intense free market competition resulted in cheaper oil prices and more diverse petroleum products. Critics claimed that success in meeting consumer needs was driving other companies out of the market who were not as successful. An example of this thinking was given in 1890 when Rep. William Mason, arguing in favor of the Sherman Antitrust Act, said, Trusts have made products cheaper, have reduced prices, but if the price of oil, for instance, were reduced to one cent a barrel, it would not right the wrong done to people of this country by the trusts which have destroyed legitimate competition and driven honest men from legitimate business enterprise. The Sherman Antitrust Act prohibits the restraint of trade. Defenders of Standard Oil insist that the company did not restrain trade, they were simply superior competitors. The federal courts ruled otherwise. Some economic historians have observed that Standard Oil was in the process of losing its monopoly at the time of its breakup in 1911. 
Although Standard had 90% of American refining capacity in 1880, by 1911 that had shrunk to between 60 and 65%, due to the expansion in capacity by competitors. Numerous regional competitors such as Pure Oil in the East, Texaco and Gulf Oil in the Gulf Coast, Cities Service and Sun in the Midcontinent, Union in California, and Shell Overseas had organized themselves into competitive vertically integrated oil companies, the industry structure pioneered years earlier by Standard itself. In addition, demand for petroleum products was increasing more rapidly than the ability of Standard to expand. The result was that although in 1911 Standard still controlled most production in the older regions of the Appalachian Basin 78% share, down from 92% in 1880, Lima, Indiana 90%, down from 95% in 1906, and the Illinois Basin 83%, down from 100% in 1906, its share was much lower in the rapidly expanding new regions that would dominate U.S. oil production in the 20th century. In 1911 Standard controlled only 44% of production in the Midcontinent, 29% in California, and 10% on the Gulf Coast. Some analysts argue that the breakup was beneficial to consumers in the long run, and no one has ever proposed that Standard Oil be reassembled in pre-1911 form. ExxonMobil, however, does represent a substantial part of the original company. Since the breakup of Standard Oil, several companies, such as General Motors and Microsoft, have come under antitrust investigation for being inherently too large for market competition, however, most of them remained together. The only company since the breakup of Standard Oil that was divided into parts like Standard Oil was AT&T, which after decades as a regulated natural monopoly, was forced to divest itself of the Bell system in 1984. Topic: <laughs> Successor companies. The successor companies from Standard Oil's breakup form the core of today's U.S. oil industry. Several of these companies were considered among the seven sisters who dominated the industry worldwide for much of the 20th century. They include Standard Oil of New Jersey or ESO or Jersey Standard, merged with Humble Oil to form Exxon, now part of ExxonMobil. Standard Trust Companies Carter Oil, Imperial Oil Canada, and Standard of Louisiana were kept as part of Standard Oil of New Jersey after the breakup. Standard Oil of New York, or Socony, merged with Vacuum, renamed Mobil, now part of ExxonMobil. Standard Oil of California, or SoCal, renamed Chevron, became Chevron Texaco, but returned to Chevron. Standard Oil of Indiana, or Staniland, renamed Amico, American Oil Co., now part of BP. Standards Atlantic and the independent company Richfield merged to form Atlantic Richfield Company or ARCO, subsequently became part of BP, and has since been sold to Tessero. Atlantic operations were spun off and bought by Sunoco. Standard Oil of Kentucky, or CAISO, was acquired by Standard Oil of California, currently Chevron. The Standard Oil Company Ohio, or Sohio, the original Standard Oil corporate entity, acquired by BP in 1987. The Ohio Oil Co., or The Ohio, marketed gasoline under the Marathon name. The company is now known as Marathon Petroleum, and was often a rival with the in state standard spin off, Sohio. Other standard oil spin offs 
Standard Oil of Iowa, pre-1911 bought out by Chevron. Standard Oil of Minnesota, pre-1911 bought out by Amico. Standard Oil of Illinois, pre-1911 bought out by Amico. Standard Oil of Kansas, refining only, eventually bought out by Amico. Standard Oil of Missouri, pre-1911 dissolved. Standard Oil of Louisiana, originally owned by Standard Oil of New Jersey, now by Exxon. Standard Oil of Brazil, originally owned by Standard Oil of New Jersey, now by Exxon. Other companies divested in the 1911 breakup. Note, Standard Oil of Colorado was not a successor company, the name was used to capitalize on the Standard Oil brand in the 1930s. Standard Oil of Connecticut is a fuel oil marketer not related to the Rockefeller companies. <laughs> Rights to the name Of the 34 baby standards, 11 were given rights to the Standard Oil name, based on the state they were in. Conoco and Atlantic elected to use their respective names instead of the Standard name, and their rights would be claimed by other companies. By the 1980s, most companies were using their individual brand names instead of the standard name, with Amico being the last one to have widespread use of the standard name, as it gave Midwestern owners the option of using the Amico name or standard. Three Supermahor companies now own the rights to the standard name in the United States, ExxonMobil, Chevron Corp., and BP. BP acquired its rights through acquiring Standard Oil of Ohio and Amico, and has a small handful of stations in the Midwestern United States using the standard name. Likewise, BP continues to sell marine fuel under the Sohio brand at various marinas throughout Ohio. ExxonMobil keeps the Esso trademark alive at stations that sell diesel fuel by selling Esso diesel displayed on the pumps. ExxonMobil has full international rights to the standard name, and continues to use the Esso name overseas and in Canada. To protect its trademark Chevron has one station in each state it owns the rights to brand it as standard. Some of its standard branded stations have a mix of some signs that say standard and some signs that say Chevron. Over time, Chevron has changed which station in a given state is the standard station. Topic. See also History of the United States 1865-1918 Standard Oil Gasoline Station Disambiguation Wamsutta Oil Refinery